chapter 7. The title of the sermon is Trying to Win Without the Lord. This is Joshua 7. I'm going to be reading verses 1 through 13. Let's hear God's word. But the people of Israel broke faith in regard to the devoted things, for Achan, the son of Carmi, son of Zadi, son of Zerah, of the tribe of Judah, took some of the devoted things. And the anger of the Lord burned against the people of Israel. So Joshua sent men from Jericho to Ai, which is near beth Aven, east of Bethel, and said to them, Go up and spy out the land. And the men went up and spied, it out, sp spied out Ai. And they returned to Joshua and said to him, do not have all the people go up, but let about two or three thousand men go up and attack I. Do not make the whole people toil there, for they are few. So about three thousand men went up there from the people, and they fled before the men of I. And the men of I killed about thirty-six of their men and chased them before the gate as far as Shebarim and struck them at the descent and the hearts of the people melted and became as water. Then Joshua tore his clothes and fell to the earth on his face before the ark of the Lord until the evening, he and the elders of Israel. And they put dust on their heads. And Joshua said, Alas, O Lord God, why have you brought this people over the Jordan at all to give us into the hands of the Amorites to destroy us? Would that we had been content to dwell beyond the Jordan. O oh Lord, what can I say when Israel has turned their backs before their enemies? For the Canaanites and all the inhabitants of the land will hear of it and will surround us and cut off our name from the earth. And what will you do for your great name? And the Lord said to Joshua, get up. Why have you fallen on your face? Israel has sinned. They have transgressed my covenant that I have commanded them. They have taken some of the devoted things. They have stolen and lied and put them among their own belongings. Therefore, the people of Israel cannot stand before their enemies. They turn their backs before their enemies because they have become devoted for destruction. I will be with you no more unless you destroy the devoted things from among you. Get up, consecrate the people and say, consecrate yourself for tomorrow, thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, there are devoted things in your midst, O Israel. You cannot stand before your enemies until you take away the devoted things from among you. This is the word of the Lord. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word, which inspires and comforts, and your word, which convicts and corrects. Open our hearts to know your word, that we would respond as you would have us respond and that your word would rescue us from death through our Lord Jesus, our Savior, who redeems us from death. We pray this in his name. Amen. It is an imperative that you remember who you are. We are Christians. We belong to the Lord it's because of what the Lord Jesus has done for us. That should be first and foremost in our minds. We're not great because we have some innate greatness. 
We're not great because we have some great perfection in ourselves. We're blessed because we're God's people. That is why we're blessed. Always remember that. You belong to the Lord. When you remember you belong to the Lord, you are less likely to do the things that he says don't do. He'll be more likely to do the things that he says do. You're more likely to take everything in prayer and not assume that you can just go on and do things by yourself. The things of the Lord influence you, your thoughts, everything. Prayer is something that is missing in the Israelites in this passage. Quick recap, Joshua and the Israelites win a great battle over Jericho. Joshua fed the battle of Jericho, and they saw the power of God. This was unmistakable. They saw that with God's power, they could defeat the greatest enemy. The most secure defenses would fall before the Lord. And the last chapter ends with the line, Joshua's fame goes out through all the land. You know, the Lord was with Joshua. His fame was in the land. Joshua became something that was feared, someone who was feared. And now they come and they fight a small town a small place, is not defended as Jericho was. They should be able to take it easily. And they're thinking past I to the next one that would be more challenging, perhaps. I know you can't or shouldn't compare war and sports, but there is something often common in sports where a team comes and, look, the next, the next opponent's nothing. Let's forget about them. Let's think about the, the one that's coming that's really important. And often they'll lose that because they forgot to actually pay attention to what they were doing. Well, this is sort of like that, but it's even more. Here, they take more than overconfidence that is their undoing. It is their inattention to the Lord. In fact, they have lost attention to the Lord to the fact that they don't even realize that the presence and the blessing of God is no longer with them. Something missing in their battle prep. There is no record of prayer. There is no seeking the Lord's blessing. There's no looking and asking for the Lord what they should do. In the last battle, Joshua goes down. He looks at Jericho, and there he meets the army, of the captain of the army of the Lord, who comes with drawn sword. And the captain of the host of heaven tells him what he is supposed to do. And essentially what they do, they wait for the Lord to make the battle over, the walls to fall, and they go in and they just have a mop-up operation. And that should have kept the find, but it doesn't seem to be the case. It's almost as though they said, as they came to Jericho and realized they couldn't beat it, that they followed the Lord very carefully, and they did. But they come to the next and said, we got this one on our own. That's a mistake. Because they didn't have that on their own. Not only their presumption, the presumption they could do it without the Lord, but they missed something even more important because they had had sin in the camp, which is going to bring their downfall. When we try to do the Lord's work without his power and presence, we will fail. We can do something, but to do the Lord's work, we need the Lord's power and presence gets worse. They not only forget to ask the Lord, but they forget the Lord's presence, and they don't realize they do not have the Lord's presence. They're spiritually blind to the fact that they are defenseless. The covering of the Lord is gone. Because what they did was they exchanged their union with Christ, union with God, part of God's people, And they took union with Jericho. Jericho was destroyed. Jericho was condemned. It was devoted to destruction. And by taking that from Jericho into themselves, they have added themselves the curse of Jericho. One man does it. One family does it. But it is the undoing of the whole people. The Lord's judgment on Jericho was severe. It was total. 
and it was final. Everything that had anything to do with this city was going to be destroyed. The only thing that would be taken out of there were the metals, and they were going to be given to the treasury of the Lord. This is the only city that's going to be judged in this way. Usually there are spoils of war that happen. Here there are no spoils of war going to the people at all. The only one to escape this city would be Rahab, who threw her lot in with the people of God and was received as part of people of God. This is a lot like the destruction of Sodom. Everyone and everything in Sodom was destroyed, except those who were pulled out of Sodom. There is someone, though, in Israel who took something out of Jericho and he joined himself by taking the thing that was cursed to the curse of Jericho. And he became devoted to destruction. And he took that into the people of Israel and now they had the same curse upon them that was on Jericho. So rather than rid the land of the wickedness of Jericho, they are sustaining it in a sense and become part of the problem. Joshua and the leadership do not seek the Lord before battle. They don't even seek the Lord's blessing. They don't even realize the danger that they're in. And one thing leads to another. The text tells us all this in the very first verse. And then it tells what happens. So we get the God's eye view of what's going on. Look at the first verse again. The people of Israel broke faith in regard to the devoted things for Achan, son of Carmi, son of Zabdi, son of Zerah of the tribe of Judah, took some of the devoted things. And the anger of the Lord burned against the people of Israel. Note, one man took it. But the Lord's anger is against all of the, the people. What are the instructions given? Don't take anything from the city. Don't take the animals. Don't take the prisoners. Don't take the clothing. Don't take the gold. That goes to the treasury of the Lord. Everything else stays there. Leave it there. The whole place is devoted to destruction. Don't join yourself to that which is being destroyed. This is what the Lord said. Leave it there. And Achan figured, well, I could ignore that. It'll be okay. Who would know? Surely it's not a big deal. God said it, and it was a big deal. It was a big deal. You saw what a big deal it was when you see the destruction of God come upon this city. people didn't listen. Achan didn't listen. The Lord's people must listen. A central, in, in, the, in the Jewish nation, something that becomes a, a, a creed almost, it, an identifier, is in Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 4. Hear, O Israel, the Lord your God, the Lord is one. It's the Shema. That's the first word. Shema. Listen, hear, hear, O Israel. Hear. Psalm 81, 8 tells the people of God, Oh, but if you would listen to me. If you would but listen to me. But over and over, they do not listen. Adam and Eve was, were told, Adam specifically, and he told Eve, the Lord said, do not eat of the tree in the center of the garden of the knowledge of good and evil. Don't do this. But they don't listen to the Lord. Instead, they listen to the serpent. We need to listen to the Lord. Listen. Listen and follow. Trust and obey. There were, there were orders given, a word given to the army of how they should act. Do you remember? All right, you're going to get up. They get up early. Everyone's going to march around once. And they come back and they go into the camp. Did they do that? Yes, they did. Second day, same thing. Third, fourth, fifth, sixth, same thing. Seventh day, keep going, 
keep going, don't even say a word until the seventh lap and then they say, shout and the walls fall. Now, does that make any sense to you militarily? I'm not a military guy, but that doesn't make much sense to me. It doesn't have to make sense. It was the instructions given by the Lord and they followed because the Lord said, do it. That's what they should have done. And what happened? The Lord took the city. They all heard and they all obeyed. That's the first part, taking the city. The second part was just as clear. And if you'd seen what God did after you followed the first part, you should be encouraged to follow the second part. But in that, they did not. The second part was, don't take anything from this. The whole city is being condemned. Achan thought better. He thought he was smarter than the Lord. He thought the Lord wouldn't know. He had just seen the severity of God's judgment on this city, but didn't take it to heart. The Lord commands the battle. The Lord commands the peace. In the difficult times, the Lord gives us instruction. In the blessing time, he also gives us instruction. You don't want to win the battle and lose the peace. Well, this scene shifts from the, the first, the interpretation here that we need to understand and those who will fight it. You know, first verse, we understand what's going to happen. Uh, first, and now it shifts to the people who are actually going to fight. And they don't know what's going to happen next. Verse 2. Joshua sent men from Jericho to Ai, which is near Beth-Avon, east of Bethel, and said to them, Go up and spy out the land. And the men went out and spied out Ai. Standard tactics. Next city is Ai. What do we do? Let's go look at at it. Let's find out. Scouts figure out what they're out, up against. They say, not much. They give their report. They're not impressed. Verse 3, they returned to Joshua and said to him, do not have all the people go up, but let's about two or 3,000 go up and attack I, and don't make the whole people go up to toil there, for they are few. You know, I is, is uh, easy. Shouldn't take many of us to defeat that. Not like Jericho. Doesn't need special strategy. Maybe doesn't even need the Lord's presence, they thought. A strike force, two or three thousand, that'll go take them out. It appears Joshua doesn't go up to look it over either. But they decide to let the junior officers take the lead. Does Joshua even go out and fight with them? Perhaps not. But one thing that's conspicuously missing here is prayer. They don't seek the Lord. They look at the size of the army against them or the city against them and figure, well, it doesn't even occur to them to ask the Lord's favor for this. We really need to ask the Lord's favor for things. We need to take everything to the Lord. We are told to thank the Lord for our daily bread, and we think, well, I've got plenty of food. I don't need to do that. Yes, we do, because the reason we have food, plenty or, or scarce, is because the Lord has provided it for us. So they're going to head off and try to win without the Lord, as if they didn't need his aid, assuming everything was right with them and the Lord, but it was not. And the Lord was silent. The withdrawal of the Lord's favor was there. They had taken the cursed thing, and they'd taken Jericho into themselves. Not all of them did it. They were likely unaware that Achan had done this but they were not under the blessing and protection of God. What's the result? Verse 4. About 3,000 men went up there from the people. At least they put the high number instead of 2,000, 3,000. But what happened? And they fled before the men of Ai. The men of Ai killed about 36 of their men and chased them before the gate as far as Shebarim, and struck them down at the descent, and the hearts of the people melted and became as water. Two things happen here. One, an unexpected loss of the fighting force includes the death of some of the men in battle. 
You know, everything they could see, it should not have gone this way, but it did go this way. And that leads to the second tragedy. One, they lost, but two, why? What happened? What could possibly have happened that could have made us lose this battle? We had the favor of God with us in the last one, and now we were the ones favored to win, but did not. We lost to an insignificant town. Was God's favor no longer with them? And the answer is no, it was not. So what's going to happen? We're on this side of the Jordan. We're trapped in here. All the people of the land, if they're not afraid of us, and we have nothing and no one to protect us, we're done for. We're all going to die. It had been said in the end of the last chapter that Joshua's fame was in the land. And the people heard that the hearts of everyone in the land, their hearts were like water because they were terrified of this people that have come. But now the emotion was in the other chest. They were the ones terrified. They were the ones who didn't know what to do. Joshua knew what to do. He humbled himself and he prayed. And he prayed with all of his might. We pray always. When things are going well, we, we pray well. When things are going really badly, we pray with more earnest. This is what I feel. This is what I do. You have a sickness that is serious with you or someone else, and you begin to pray fervently and often. You have a broken relationship. You cry out to the Lord. Why? Because there's nowhere else to go. Trouble gets our attention. Difficulty gets our attention. We lose the job. We become robbed. A loved one dies. Great trials. They drive us to the Lord. That's a good Christian response, and it should be. You know, where else could we go? Again, we look at Job. Job, and, and they said, well, God's doing this to you. And he says, well, what does that matter? There's nowhere else to go but to the Lord. You can't go to someone greater than the Lord to convince the Lord not to do it. It's to the Lord who is the one who saves. Even if the Lord is behind it all, the Lord's over everything. For God's people, there's nowhere else to turn but to the Lord. Only our Savior can save us. Where can I go but to the Lord? Joshua had just come through the most phenomenal victory over Jericho. Not only did they win, but special, spectacular help from God. The Lord was with them. And because of that, they were unstoppable. The next town's small. They could dispatch it easily. But they don't. They lost. How could they who were so mighty? How could they who were so strong, so victorious, lose to this small town? But more disturbing is the question, how could they, as the Lord's people, with the Lord's favor, lose to any, let alone a small town? And then the most horrifying thought of all, what if we don't have the favor of God anymore, but have the judgment of God? What then? Verse 6, Joshua tore his clothes and fell to the earth on his face before the ark of the Lord until evening. He and the elders of Israel, they put dust on their heads. No minor setback back here. This was of major, major proportions. The loss showed there was something wrong between them and the Lord, and without the Lord, they knew they were finished. Again, sackcloth and ashes, dust on the head. This is even a physical way of humility and humbling themselves before God. It says all the way until evening, they were not going to stop until the Lord sent his word. You know, if they'd failed praying going into battle, they're certainly not going to fail to pray now. On they pray. Verse 7, Joshua said, Alas, O Lord God, why have you brought this people over to the Jordan at all to give us into the hands of the Amorites to destroy us? They were surrounded by enemies. Victory or death, like the Romans, they would take and they would burn their, their, their vessels on the shore. It's like, we're, there's no retreating. We're going to survive here. We're going to win here. 
Well, that's kind of what they did when they crossed the Jordan. The Jordan opens for them to go through, and then it closes. They can't get back across that very easily. Not now. No retreat. Would that we had been content to dwell beyond the Jordan. They're over their heads here without the Lord. Verse 8, O Lord, what can I say when Israel has turned its back before their enemies? For the Canaanites and all the inhabitants of the land will hear of it and will surround us and cut off our name from the earth. And what will you do for your great name? There is, a, again, an appeal to God. You might remember when the children of Israel just, there was, they, they again were, were faithless, and the Lord said to, to Moses, you know, I could, I could wipe them out and start over with you. And Moses said, no, no, think too of your own name. What about those in Egypt that saw all your great wonders there? They'll say, oh, you just, he brought them up out of Egypt, but this God couldn't take them into the promised land. There's an appeal to the glory of God. That's a good thing. And this is exactly what Joshua says. They're stunned by the loss. Why had the Lord abandoned them? It seemed to be against them. They don't know, perhaps, about Achan and the sin of taking the devoted things. They didn't know that this Achan had joined himself to the things of Jericho by taking that into his own possession and then brought them along with them. Achan, who condemned his own family by joining with Jericho, just in the opposite way that Rahab saved her whole family by joining with the people of God. So Joshua didn't know what to do, and he pleads before the Lord. In that way, he's kind of like Job, isn't he? He's, he's, he doesn't know why this has happened. Well, the Lord tells him, and he's clear. Verse 10, the Lord said to Joshua, get up. Why have you fallen on your face? Israel sinned. They transgressed my covenant that I commanded them. They've taken some of the devoted things, which they've stolen and lied, and put them in their own belongings. Now, this is the, the tone that I hear. Joshua is face down and he's torn his clothing and there's dust on his head. You know, Lord, why has this happened? And the Lord says, get up. There's sin that's happened. It, it's, it's like it, it, enough of, of this, there's something that needs to be done. Something that needs to be found out here. You know, they didn't lose this because the Lord is fickle. Well, maybe I'll help you today. Maybe I won't. No, the Lord is faithful. They were the ones who were uh, capricious. The Lord gave instructions for the battle, and they followed him for the battle. The Lord gave instructions for what's to be done after. That was not followed. And that second instruction, everything to be left there, all to be buried, the whole city was to be judged, nothing to be taken out, but someone did take something out, and that was the problem. This was the instructions they did not obey. Seems Joshua didn't understand this, but in a sense he should have because everyone obeyed the first set of instructions. It shouldn't be a mystery. It's like the command that Adam gave, or that God gave Adam in the garden, do not eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. That's clear and it's uncomplicated and do not do this. That seems to be a little easier to keep. It's not do this great thing and then you'll be okay with him. You know, just don't do that. And so they did that. Over and over he says to the people of Israel, don't make any idols. And what do they keep doing? Making idols. It's real easy to not make idols. Just don't make idols. But the heart, the heart makes idols. It's the same here. Don't take the gold, but that lust for the gold. Oh, surely we don't let this to go to waste. It wasn't supposed to go to waste, but go to the treasury of the Lord. Well, he won't miss much, will he? No, that's not it. Threefold sin here, I think, at least. It says Israel 
has sinned and have transgressed my covenant that I commanded them. That's the nature of sin. There's a breaking with God. God requires his people to follow the covenant, but they didn't. The first is they've taken some of the devoted things. They should have been set aside to give to the Lord. They were, all, they were going to be given the spoils of all the other battles. This one was like a first fruit to the Lord. This one was a special judgment on Jericho. Whatever the reason, God said, it's all here. They've taken that. Then he says they've stolen it because they've taken it from the Lord. It should have gone to the Lord. And then third aspect, they lied about it. Thought they could pull a fast one on the Lord. He won't know. Oh, but he does know. And the judgment against Israel follows straight from their breaking faith. Verse 12, therefore the people of the Israel cannot stand before their enemies. They turn their backs before their enemies because they have become devoted for destruction. And there it said plainly, they have become devoted to destruction just as Jericho had been. That's what this means. I will be with you no more unless you destroy the devoted things from among you. The army will lose before every battle every army with the Lord, not with them. With the Lord, they defeat every foe. Now they will lose to any and all. What do they have to do? They have to repent. They have to correct the situation. Humbling themselves before the Lord with sackcloth and ashes is, is good, but there's more now that the lie is there, the theft is there, the embracing of that which is to be destroyed. It has to be discovered. It has to be returned. And verse 13, again, get up. Get up. Consecrate the people and say, Consecrate yourselves tomorrow, for thus says the Lord, the God of Israel. There are devoted things in your midst. You cannot stand before your enemies until you take away the devoted things from among you. Get up. Take action that fits with repentance. Tell the people why they lost this battle. Tell them they'll continue to lose as long as they keep the devoted things. And once they do this, they will be blessed again. They'll be given the land. It's important to realize the important, the, the seriousness of sin and the Lord's judgment, especially for the severe measures that they just saw in Jericho. Now there are some applications. Important to recognize that the battle of Jericho, the battle of Ai, these are specific there. They don't directly apply to us and yet there are principles there that do apply to our lives. They're unique. They're not reproduced but there's principles there. One is this. Self-sufficiency is dangerous. We dare not think we can do the Lord's work without the power and favor of the Lord. We need the Lord, totally dependent on the Lord. This is not something we outgrow, like children who are totally dependent on parents, and then later they grow up and they go and they live their lives. No, we're always dependent on the Lord, and as we grow, we grow greater in our realization that we are dependent on the Lord and our strength can grow as well. Also, don't plan without praying. If you think things are going well and you can handle things on your own, that's not what God's people do. God's people pray. Some people get the idea that, well, I don't want to bother God. God is ready to hear our prayers. This is what he does. God's people go to the Lord always. What are we to do? Glorify him. Call on him. One of the things that the people of, of Israel and the people of God generally must do is call on the Lord. And it's not enough to say, well, I don't want you calling on other gods. Of course not. But you call upon me. This is what the Lord would say. Because he is our God. He is our Savior. We don't fight our battles on our own. We don't save ourselves. As the old spiritual says, 
Keep a praying. God will fight your battles. God will fight your battles if you just keep still. Also, make sure you follow what God said to do. God says, do this. This is what you do. God says, don't do this. Then you don't do that. It's important. Don't make idols. Don't embrace the things that God hates. Don't be like the world. Don't operate like the world. The Bible says when things are going well, be thankful. When things are difficult, consider God has made both one and the other. When we're in trial, sometimes the trials will be of our own making, as they were here for the people of Israel. And there needs to be repentance. There needs to be action of repentance. Sometimes they're not directly our own doing, but God is getting growth through that. But we always should look in our hearts. Trouble causes us to call to the Lord. Difficulty causes us to call to the Lord. In all these, God's a great, God is gracious. He does not leave the children of Israel in a position of estrangement. He provides the word which calls them back. God does the same for us. We must keep listening. Oh, but if you would but listen, my people. Let's pray. Father, I thank you that you win our battles. You are our Savior. We are totally dependent upon you. And because of that, we have real life. Show us our own hearts. Show us the difficulties that we go through, that they would, those difficulties would cause us to call to you. And we do. Lord, reveal in us areas where we need to repent, to repay, to repair. That you'd be glorified. And Lord, we thank you that you are greater than us in love as well as power and wisdom, holiness, justice, and strength. Direct us, fill us, give us your victory through Christ. We pray this in his name. Amen.